Mm. It's pumpkin spice latte and Apple operating system update season. Every fall, Apple delivers to us an aromatic array of new features that should make using their devices better and easier. Should. What we're getting is iOS and iPadOS 16, macOS 13, Ventura, and watchOS 9. They all include a lot of new features and revisions, but what I'm noticing this time around is not just the features each platform gets, but also the features they all share. What does this mean for the whole concept of the operating system for Apple going forward? If you look at some sections of Apple's all new features pages on their website, you can see that many of the updates are exactly the same verbatim between all the operating systems. Messages, Safari, Mail, iCloud photo sharing, Home, Photos, Reminders, Live Text, and a bunch of others. The new features added to these apps are doled out to all devices equally. This is a good thing as it means you won't lose out on functionality using the same app between different devices. You can undo send and edit iMessages and emails no matter what keyboard you wrote them on. How you surf in Safari won't have to be limited by your screen size. The way you organize your reminders on your Mac won't be any different than on your iPhone. But are these updates really worthy of WWDC? Would they have even been noticed on previous releases like Panther, Snow Leopard, or Lion? I don't think so. Photos is a standalone cross-platform app. Safari is a standalone cross-platform app. Reminders is a standalone cross-platform service. And yet, their updates are arbitrarily tied to the broader operating system update. This can be really annoying too. Take Maps, for instance. You can finally make a multi-stop route no matter which device you're using. This is an easy feature that should have been added years ago. Yet, to get it, you have to update each device's entire operating system. You might think that this means the operating systems are converging all into one harmonious whole, with only but a screen size to differentiate them. If Apple was doing that, feature parity like we're seeing would be a necessary step. So, is this preparation for one Apple OS to rule them all? Touchscreens on the Mac? I'd argue no, because these changes to the cross-platform apps just increase usability across the ecosystem. And if you take a close look beyond them, you'll find that these OSs are as different from each other as ever. Despite the fact that it's going to be a little delayed, iPad OS looks to be the most transformed this year. After all our dogged complaining, Apple is really bringing the iPad into its more capable own. Toolbars are customizable now, allowing developers and power users to personalize and optimize their app's functions. It looks like a promising step forward as the iPad moves further away from the iPhone and closer in capability to the Mac. The biggest demonstration of this is Stage Manager. It's a new app windowing feature available only to M1 powered iPads. Instead of being limited to two full screen apps side by side with a slide over floater for good measure, you can now pile and resize groups of windowed apps together on the screen, and then switch between those piles based on what you're working on. It's improved since I first tried it earlier this summer, but despite these soft round corners, there are still rough edges. Apps aren't freely movable and resizable. They kind of just snap into set sizes and positions. It's quite interesting that you cannot completely cover app windows over one another. These behaviors will require getting used to, and developers are going to have to put in a lot of work to support all these new layouts, as you can see. Even on this big iPad Pro screen, I don't think I'd use Stage Manager, but hooked up to an external monitor, it's a game changer. Now the iPad really is a tangible computer replacement for those who can work within the platform's bumper guards. Though, if you're used to a desktop operating system, don't forget that you will probably run into mouse interactions that won't work like you're expecting. Touch first, everyone. Also, on a Mac, you can close, minimize, and maximize windows with the traffic lights on the top corner of a window. Here, those options are buried under an annoying submenu. Speaking of the Mac, which is getting an update I'll rant about, this video is sponsored by Ugreen and their Nexode 140 watt charger. Yes, that's right, you can power and charge a 16 inch MacBook Pro from zero to 60% in less than 35 minutes. 
Or if you're with a friend, the charger will charge two MacBooks and a phone at the same time, super fast. This is the power user's charger to rule them all. So learn more about the Nexode 140 watt charger from Ugreen at the link below. Now while your Mac is charging, you'll be interested in knowing that Stage Manager is here too. And because the operating system was engineered from the ground up to support resizable windowing, it works much better. Here, think about it as an alternative way to organize tasks in Windows compared to Mission Control. Next, we have something that works great on the iPad, but not so much on the Mac. They have replaced the System Preferences with the System Settings app. Same stovetop logo, though. It's adopted the sidebar format found on Apple's mobile devices. That makes it easier to find the section you're looking for at a glance, but I'm not bowled over by the controls and layout once you're in there. Everything feels more complex. Look at how these alignments have changed, creating redundant space between the options and their selections. It's very hard to see things at a glance. The screens are so much bigger, and I'm really not convinced that mobile UI paradigms should be in desktop operating systems. Wait, macOS has a noise machine? An accessibility? Well, that's hard to find. And why is this a toggle switch? Why is this a window? What? Why did they choose? Developer Nikki Tonsky posted a thread on Twitter showing just how rough the early beta versions of this app are and showcased some of the questionable UI choices Apple has made with it. I find it so unrelentingly gray, like this list of toggles that look grayed out as if you can't use them, but oh, you can. Also, these were the gesture videos to show you how to use your magic mouse and trackpad before. These are the new ones. This is what software feels like these days in microcosm. We've gone from a rich, beautiful, understandable video to an uninspiring, abstract, boring animation bound to pique the curiosity of exactly no one. Because everything has moved around so much, I'm going to recommend that you only update to Ventura when you're mentally prepared to. But don't worry, like iPadOS, this update will be coming a bit later. Now the update worth installing is iOS. I absolutely love the look of the new lock screen. It makes the phone so much more useful at a glance, something my Apple Watch is great at. You can now add simple widgets and set your wallpaper to shuffle photos from your library. And if you don't have widgets enabled, the clock can now be cleverly placed behind your photo subject. You can even change the clock's font. Notifications are piled up at the bottom now, out of the way. And finally, as your mood changes, you can swipe between all your multiple themes which can also be tied to different focus modes. I do have some niggles. On some wallpapers, the widgets can become completely illegible because there's no contrast. And disappointingly, all the options and freedom we get on the lock screen comes with a commensurate removal of options for the home screen. Apple's default wallpaper options are all but gone unless you use the same background as the lock screen. Oh, and check this out in the Photos app. That's cool. I've always hated doing that on Photoshop. Apple's finally showing us what capabilities the neural engine can bring to software, adding to live text to video and dictation improvements. Other than these main highlights, you're really not gonna notice the improvements in day-to-day -day use, unless you really dig deep. Adam Angst at Tidbits did a survey asking people what features from last year's releases people were using, and the results showed that a wide majority of users didn't use any of the new features, save for live text. It makes me wish for a release that has no new features and is just bug fixes and refinements. A year long feature moratorium. Wouldn't that be great? Thanks for worsening the UI of this MAC address. Now, if you are going to update your devices right away, give this video a like. And if you're gonna hold off, you might as well subscribe. Now, comment below. I'm curious what you think about a feature moratorium. No new features, just fixes. You agree?